Okay, so there was a really good question about <coughs> would I ever teach anybody to start uncocking their wrists <coughs> on the downswing? And we used Billy as an example. At the end of my lessons uh, yesterday, Billy came out and hit some balls with his shorter than normal driver with the bigger than normal grip and just flushing it and launching it seven, eight, trying to launch it high. Oh, that looks to my eye and it's going up pretty good. But it's really just launching low because he basically that's what he does. So just like Colin Montgomery might not be able to use the shot in real golf, still he wants to know how to do it. What can I do to try to get it up in the air a little bit more? And I suggested to him that he try to imagine that standing to the right of him here, I'll tee one up, because he was hitting driver. You could do this with a nine, just easy. Standing right here with Shaquille O'Neal kind of coming in to block his shot. Shaq's real tall. So it's like trying to get the club head to go up and over. Now, he didn't do that, but it did help him a lot. Oh, oh, Launch went up a lot. Good hands, bro. Good hands. Long angle. Not much. I was up to start with three-ish, and then it went up to more like five and a half. So you can you can you can hit up on the ball and launch it low. You can hit down on the ball and launch it high, and then you can do the other two. Right. So. But it was just launching too low, and he was losing a lot of life. I mean, he was swinging in the neighborhood. I gave Kenny Kim a couple lessons. Of, well, you, you, you might know him, a good player in the area. And I mean, Kenny's last ball he hit was 315 in the air. And he's not swinging 10 miles an hour faster than Billy. And Billy's hitting at like 265 in the air. Because it was just the 270. So, <laughs> it's a little low. Right? <laughs> so it's, it might be rolling out to three and a quarter, but you know, so he's just trying to get it up a little bit. So now, why? Why, why? Because we're trying to get the swing radius bigger, just because as soon as you make the hula hoop bigger, the bottom of the hula hoop is flatter. So it's a little bit easier, you have more time to line the club up and get the ball in the air. And also, um, if, he, if, if he would have been hitting down on it too much too, would you probably do the same thing. And what we did with him first, and uh, we did a second go for the camera was on. Was we, we, we got up to the top of the swing, and what I'll do, we'll use my same. I'm sorry, what's your name again? Eric. Eric. Newly Eric. Eric. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'll tell you what, face the camera. Okay. So he's a lefty. That's good. He's like a regular golfer, righty, right? So make your back swing. And what I did was, what I'll do is I'll, I'll hold the person's torso, not let them shift and not uh, try not to let them turn and try to give them give, give me the first little bit of hands and arms in the swing now we do what you did before he couldn't do anything he was trying to move the club by moving his torso okay and most people i'll i'll, I'll you know i'll be like this like i said if they were better looking better. <laughs> right, like this, right and 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 i'll freeze a person arms thanks i'll freeze a person's arms I ain't touching it wrong. Right? So what should happen? Okay, so there's three changes of direction in any reasonable golf. Swing. You don't have to go like Roy McIlwain. The first one I would suggest is the torques at the feet. About this far in the backswing, let's say if you had norm if you didn't, you know, set it late. Right here, maybe right here. You already are starting to twist your feet, push this way on the ground to start pushing off this way to slow you down. Never forget, you used to have a thing, y'all probably saw it, called a swing memory device. Looks like the perfect swing trainer. You would connect it to a window. And I went over to my buddy Mark Nunez's house and his two little pretty daughters that are grown and one of them married now. And had a hole in it and said, okay, you make a Candace or a Christina, either one of them. I said, make a backswing, and he did this. I mean, they, they literally went all the way around back to the dress. You know, I, I'm not going to do that. My shoulder is worse than it's already messed up. So the first thing that happens is your feet start trying to help you slow down. <coughs> then the second thing you can plainly see, you know, the lower body moving, 
bump still kind of goes back a little bit. And then the third trans uh, change of direction would be the club movement. Okay. So forget about the torque at the feet thing, but I wanted to, because we talked about that earlier, I wanted to bring that back up. So, when the body starts pushing off this way, the arm gets close, the lead arm gets closer to the torso. But when the club starts moving, so when you tell somebody move the club, tell them move the club, you're not talking about, you're grabbing them anyway, they ain't gonna do much of a trans, you know, transition. The, the arm should start getting away from the chest, away from the chest, away from the chest, away from the chest, the whole way down. That's why you look like this. So, dragging the arm down for any length of time. I'm not saying people don't do it. Not ideal. Not ideal. Because you want to get the arm off of the chest pretty much right away. Now, if you do that, and you're, and you're trying to do this, you're not going to overcome the fact, and again, I, I answered this for some of y'all, but just for everybody in the, in the film, the center of mass of the golf club is balance point right there plus this way because of the toe of the club, so like right here. As long as your hands, this is the top of my backswing here, as long as your hands are going this way, you can try to do this all you want, but you're pretty much not gonna do it if you can play dead to war moves. You're gonna lag the crud out of right here, no matter. And matter of fact, you might, like somebody that's not as good as golf as Billy, that we were talking about giving them this lesson yesterday, you'll have some like pretty decent players lag it more, trying to throw it over the top of that PGA play. Because their hands go further this way. And if their arm starts getting off their chest, the hands can go further this way. So everything is about making that circle bigger and that's how you can affect the um, really easy way to affect the angle of attack. And in Billy's case, it was the launch angle. There was another question. Yeah. Okay, so so you, you have this hand path, right? You have this path your hands take. And early on, your hands are moving along the hand. You're trying to, the force is directed along the hand path. So my hand's kind of like that. The force is going like that. That leaves the club behind. Now, you, you've got to go from this position, this is where Billy was, halfway down trying to throw it. So something like this at this point, because anything more this way, you just don't want to do it. So I'm just telling you right now. It doesn't work on a double pendulum model. It doesn't work in that 3D model. And the people that have tried to do it in the golf swing, God bless them hitting the driver. It's just you, 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 there's no way to get the, there's no way to line it up with the left arm starting to get to this position. Now some people do it because. I've seen some long hitters, everybody puts up a picture of like Mobley or something like this, it kind of looks like this, so you know we look like this right here. Scott Stallings looks like he's going tangential down here. And the person who took the video and sent it to me from the Masters in the practice round said he couldn't hit it on the planet. He's got big high club head speed. So anyway, back to what I was talking about. So if you want to get to somewhere like here, that means at this point, there's this much of this that has to happen. And I'm saying that some people, some people, need to be taught to do that. Now, just like, uh, I think Eric, you had the question of like teaching somebody to flick it, but aren't all the amateurs, hackers, you know, average golfers, already like throwing it away crazy anyway? Okay, I would say, and I said 99% before, and that's just a typical off the cuff, but 95%. I'm going to give myself a little breathing room of the people that I teach to try to do what we did, you know, when I brought the young man up and I tried to flap him where he is. <laughs> wow, right? That's people that have been taught to do this. They have to be retaught. When you get an amateur golfer, they're, you know, they're, 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 putting, they're putting the speed in the club in anyway, just out of just coordination, right? So that's... So, so you're, you're saying those are the five percent? No, five percent of the people. But I'm thinking of one person just off the top of my head, Robbie Merrill. So Robbie Merrill is one of these guys. Um, comes to me two and a half years ago, says I'm a five. You know what that means, right? Yeah. Can't be. <laughs> I, I can't right now. I haven't played golf in four months. That means. What does that mean? The USGA it means half the time. You have a 77 adjusted school. 
So he's a five, he wants to play the tool. I made my money, he's a perfect shaped guy, 121 mile an hour club head speed. So they're like, this guy is like, look, he would be shaped like me if I went on like the fat person TV show and they worked me out. It'd be 155 like I was in 1987 with Ben Doyle, picture up short Greg, and wearing size 31 waist. So the guy's got enough physical ability to do it. Now, at some point, he's now like a plus one or two, a lot better golfer. And we get him on AMM, which is the wide, one of the wired 3D systems, and he flicks it kind of weak, like grant weight. It, the graph kind of went up like, kind of like this angle, kind of came, kind of came down on this angle. That's a pretty hard flick. But kind of like this. And the peak was in the wrong place. And so he did this kind of weak, and he did it a little late. I think, right, that that would mean he overleaved the shaft. No. <laughs> he had too much dynamic loft. Well, with a six iron, he had like 21 degrees of dynamic loft on track. And like they were saying before, Randy and, and, uh, and, uh, and Nick, I did. Virtue also. This comes up with my the screen name on my website is Virtuoso. So, so those people that know Mac, that's kind of funny. Okay, so Nick and Randy was talking in the system. Doesn't matter, right? If another machine measures it differently. Tour players on this thing with a six iron are like 18 and a half. So here's a guy who was flicking weekly. At least he was flicking some. And he was flicking late, and he had too much dynamic ball position himself in a position where it was too much. So we taught him, we tried a bunch of things, and that was, this just so happens, that was the next slide, the negative alpha torque. We taught him to flick it more. And I remember one of the drills we used, um, what we did was we had him grip it split-handed, like, like this. I've never used a split-handed, two and a half years ago half a year, 29 and a half years into teaching, I had never ever had a golfer swing at a golf ball with a split handed grip. But I had a theory or a hypothesis, you know, the scientists would laugh at me, it's not a theory, it's gotta have a little more to it. I had an idea that if we got him to flick it harder, he'd have his hands further forward and de it. So we had him hit shots, you know, trying to do, it's real, really hard to do, especially with a bad shoulder. He would do it, and where do you think the ball was? <coughs> Over there. So he had to learn, like the Sergio story, to get his hands further forward, and he actually started flicking it sooner because he was trying to flick it, and then the son of a gun went down to 17 and a half dynamic loft, and at some point he learned to do it, and he never thinks about it anymore, and it's fixed. So there's the, there's one of the people, he, taught, he never would ever, ever taken a golf lesson that anybody told him. And he could swing 120 miles an hour probably because of that. And he, he needed to try to flick it more, to flick it at the right time, and actually have the shaft further forward because if you don't, it, it's, it's over there. It's like the argument of do you take a slicer who, I mean, we're not going to pull a slicer out of this crowd. Um, not going to take a slicer. Power save is great when you're teaching, but not when you're talking. I could take a slicer. So there's a little thing going on, idea going on in, in golf that you would um, come on, turn on. Uh, going to let it go to sleep. Well, that's the size of the turn on here. What do you fix first on the slicer? Do you fix the club face or do you fix the path? And the, and the, the little uh, idea that's being tossed around the last few years is kind of dying a little bit. Uh, hope I had something to do with it. Is just fix the path. Because a slicer is going to put up a number on track, man. It's on now. Let me 
me reconnect here so we, we, we have some. So would you fix the slicer's path or would you fix his face? And I've always been a slicer, I'm gonna fix the face. Because he comes over the top of it and he's swinging left, I'm gonna take the reward away for him swinging left. Sort of like the same thing that happened with our, um, with our friend Robbie Mouth. So let's say that shot, it's back on, but let's just say that shot would have given you a typical slicer. You know, six degrees outside in, not a really bad piece, just a slicer. Six degrees outside in, face two degrees closed. Or open to the path, but two degrees closed. So these people go around and say, see, the face is already closed. All you have to do is fix the path. Yeah? What if he grips it like this? Like Corey Pave and putting this. What if at the top of the backswing, I had a guy one time that's face looked at the ground at the top of the backswing. <laughs> what if halfway down his face is looking at Greg McCaffrey? Is this the guy? You're going to fix his path? I mean, you know, I think it's propaganda. Look at it. Business is business, man. It's still a free country. Barely. Right. So, I'm going to fix that guy's club face. Oh, hey, won't he hit a ball left? Hopefully. Hopefully that guy fixes his club face, swings six degrees and left, and hits that fence. Because now he's not going to do that again. He's not going to do it again. Now, on that subject of what I would fix first, but this gentleman, good player, comes to me six degrees inside out. And we decide that's too much fun. Kenny Perry plays at six degrees inside out. Roy McElroy got, got over here in America, started beating our rear end, eight degree inside out with the driver. It's less than that now, but you know, you make it work. But let's say you're having trouble, can't get your fairway woods in the air, all this kind of stuff. I'm gonna fix, I'm not gonna take the guy hitting this shot. Maybe I need a couple balls, huh? I'm not gonna take the guy hitting, the reason we're using a live board is just you're gonna get more numbers. Swing in, inside out, and then drawing it back, and sometimes it overdraws, and sometimes it doesn't draw, and that's 12 inside out, and 4.5 face. So I could fix the club face, or I could fix the path. So let's say I fixed the club face. That club face was eight degrees, or seven and a half degrees, close to the path, or that's why that ball hooks so much. Well, if I fix the face, I just took a guy who could beat me, open his face to 10 degrees open and impact, and he hits it on the street right there. I might lose that guy 10 minutes into this lesson. I'm gonna fix his path, and if he hits a pull hook, we'll open the face and get him more open, get his hands in a better position, done. But that's kind of how I treat 90% of uh, hookers and slicers. So the, I'm gonna try to go through, we're gonna do most of the teaching, but I'm gonna just finish the slides off because I think there's some good information. So the last thing, that right before we went was negative alpha torque. There's actually negative, this is positive. There's negative alpha torque at impact. Again, 1969, Search for the Perfect Swing came out and they basically showed the frame of reference trick that we don't see when we look at a golf swing. I'll do it with the driver shafts, it's white, you can see these. It looks like to us, because we're just like a camera, we're just two eyes standing there watching the swing, or two eyes watching the swing that a camera in one place watch. And it looks like the bottom lever catches the top lever at some point. But they took that frame of reference out, 1969, sorry for a perfect swing, it's more like this. The middle goes back. Now everything is moving, so you'd have to change the frame of reference. You'd have to get on blob man and rod. rod. You can do that in years. You can put the camera any way you want, you'd have to keep moving it, but you could look from the shoulder out and you would see that the, um, and, and the sport, the, the video that I have, that you just, Bill Kessel, he's a hockey player, slap shot, slow motion, YouTube. And you just see him going, huh? and woo, right? It speeds, it speeds up the bottom of the head by getting this negative alpha at the top. So, Robbie Merrill with the, with the two clubs, right? Then we were in the real quick. Now we're on the ground reaction forces. Okay, Dr. Kwan. So, um, I don't really talk too much about the internet when I'm doing these talks. They're like so sort of irrelevant to you guys. But this is the kind of things you have to deal with on the internet. So, 
the first time I learned enough about ground reaction forces, I'm going to put it in my presentation. So I got to look for an image. This is what I do in case you know a lot of you guys and girls do these kind of things or want to do them one day. Working on your slideshow, go to Google Images and put in what you want. I put in center of mass, center of pressure, ground reaction force vector. Perfect picture to use that y'all would have saw if you know, I would have been more inside today of gate analysis. Center of pressure, you got a vector, you got a center of mass. Perfect. And then you got some Yahoo saying that a, gra a combined ground reaction force vector that's in gate analysis probably the first thing you learn in biomechanics class, is a made up term by a scientist looking for notoriety, popularized by a golf pro looking for notoriety. If you ever go read any of my stuff on the internet, remember how big a goofball somebody can be to say something that you could just do a Google search, one Google search, and you find out that that term was been around for 50 years. So, okay. So center of mass, when you're talking about the center of mass, you're talking about not just the center of mass of the golfer, no arms, because we play with arms and we play with the club. So that center of mass, wherever it is right now, I'd say pretty close to my big belly button, changed just a little bit because now my arms and the club are open. So there was a popular method of golf instruction that talked about a center of mass that was somewhere in the body, and that's the only one it talked about. If you're swinging your arms, I don't know how important that center of mass is. It's not the center of your mass anymore when you're swinging. Okay, center of pressure. So you got pressure on both feet, and when you're standing still, or so there's a center of mass right now, let's say it's my belly button. The center of pressure, I'm trying for it to be, right between my feet, and there's a vector pushing up. It's pushing up. What do you mean pushing up, Ryan? I don't see you levitating. <laughs> yeah, but... If you go to a wedding in New Orleans in like July and get one of those bridesmaids that went to Bourbon Street the night before, they, they often pass out standing up there as the bride is uh, doing the I do's, right? <laughs> the ground reaction force vector stopped going up and <laughs> they go straight. Okay, so there's a vector when we're standing up. Trust me about that. Uh, now, so when you, when, you, when you swing a golf club, showed you those tests, the rotational tests, this is kind of what happens. Remember, Chris Como, whee, high dive, back swing went this way, down swing went that way. So, this is kind of how you have to do it. To make something that looks like a golf swing, you have to shift your center of pressure, which is pointing through your center of mass, to the right, so that it is to the right of your center of mass creating, like uh, we saw in the Callaway thing, a moment arm, and basically you can push toward, let's say, your right ear, just because I like to use the right ear, and create a torque that will let you use the ground to assist you with rotating your mass around your center of mass. That's what we do when we make a golf swing. That's why I had all sorts of things. One of the one things, you know, or maybe this handful of things, that I've got to keep in my hands for 31 years. I always had success te teaching people to get on their right foot right away. Well, it turns out, pretty much want to do that because the best players in the world have made 95%, 90, 95% of however, maybe 100%, but at least 90 and 95% of however far their center of pressure shifts to the right on the backswing by the time the club first, first parallel. There's not a lot of turning going on there. So you get over there, now you've got that vector, you can push towards your right ear, you can use that moment on the make it make something look like a backswing. Great, now you can pull the backswing if you can. Okay, great. Now you can pull the backswing. Now, the trick is, at what point does this vector shift? You push off. So it turns out that the thing that changes, the thing that stops the backswing, I would have said, somebody would have came up to me five years ago and said, Brian, what stops the backswing? I would say, well, you know, you're restricting your hip turn a certain amount because of where your feet are on the ground, and you're not going to let your leg hyperextend, and you can only turn your shoulders so far, you can only make your arm go back so far, and that's wrong. That was good, it's wrong. It's the same thing that Barry Sanders changed direction with. The ground, he pushed off one way, and he went the other way. So if you look at those vectors, I'll be happy to show anybody some of this later. 
you get that center of pressure over there to the right, and then about right here, about left arm parallel to the ground, you start cheating the vector this way, basically pushing off. And that halts your backswing, starts moving your center of mass, which moves a little in the backswing when that center of pressure moves. And as you're coming down, by the time your left arm gets parallel to the ground in the downswing, by the time your left arm gets parallel to the ground in the downswing, you've made 95% of your left shift. Now people go, what are you talking about center of pressure? So you don't center of mass. Stop whining. People can't feel the center of mass. They can feel the pressure. When somebody was given a golf lesson in 1909 and said, shift your weight, trust me, we're talking about center of pressure. So you get on the center of pressure, like a swing catalyst, and you do like this, you'll go, oh, look at this. Shifting my weight. You're shifting your pressure. You might be shifting your weight first to shift your pressure, but if you shift your pressure, you'll shift your weight. So I wouldn't even go and worry about the math, except for what I'm going to tell you on this side. Just worry about the pressure. Now, a good example of getting that weight or getting that pressure to that left foot in time would be a happy Gilmore swing. I was really good at this before the shoulder. I ain't doing it now, but I'll do it in slow motion for you. I planned it. That's where I planned it. I hit a bunch of them. I got really good at it. I could hit it about five miles an hour further than my normal. So you, you can pretty much get a couple things out of this. One you get out of this is you want to back into it. You want to play golf like this. Good golfers are adding some hip turn to change direction. Bob man probably shows that. Ben Logan better be. Almost everybody is doing something besides that. So when I change people today who swing too far left, and they'll be way less in the golf pro group, of left, too far left and too far right, there's my go-to. So Michael Finney's always telling me, damn it, Brian, make this Real world, there's your real world. You got a person doing this, right? So-called spin out. One of these days, I'm gonna learn 7.3 degrees left, right path, that's no good. You tell that person, there's a couple ways I, I tell them. I say, you've turned your hips a certain amount going back. Push off and turn them more. Or, you're pointing your belt buckle a certain place. My buddy right here in the shades. Point it further to the right. On the, on the, so if you do that, you are captives. There's no way you're going to swing seven degrees outside in. People don't. So back to that, back to your uh, Happy Gilmore. Now I'll give y'all a different angle. And by the way, I have the movie on DVD and I ripped it. So, so, you know, so I could frame by frame it. I don't say I'm good at it. I, mean, I don't know if he ever hit any actual shots. You know, it was all after the fact. But he did it really good. So here it is right here. Take it that way. So you want that pressure over there by the time your left arm is parallel to the ground. Why? So now, you're here. You have, a, you have a moment arm on this side, and you can use the ground to rotate you this way. So, Take home, right foot early, right ear, mid back swing, left to the left ear, change of direction. If you do that, rotational torque, which is hard to explain, but it's easier with the shoe. I take my foot out of the shoe. I did it once at Costa Mesa this week. Somebody needed it. You would literally twist out of your shoe, making that move correct to the right. You would twist out of your shoe, because you're pushing this way to push this way. And if you do that, you get this nice little Van Hogan, my buddy uh, VJ Trollio wrote a book, uh, Final Missing Piece, The Hogan Secret Puzzle. It's a good book by Golf Pro. You know, self-published, really good job. So you're going right foot, whoops. Right ear, left to the left ear, move the pressure over here, left foot, left ear. That makes you look like a golfer. Looks like everybody, looks like the PGA Tour logo. So that's, that's, that's it's kind of ground reaction force factors simplified. We had some Luke Donald pictures here. Grant Wait before he, we upgraded them a little bit. Planes of motion, no fun, center of mass moving, we talked about that. 
All right, pull back, run up, and jump. Okay, so but my last fit, the two, the two things that survived the, um, the two things that you would be able to present on that survived the trans transition of, of ours and mine from folklore teaching and from scenes as if pseudoscience to whatever I'm trying to do now. Which, I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do what I'm gonna do when I stop talking about the golf swing and start teaching y'all. And that my scientist buddies, like Art Maffei, who's right over there, he watched me teach the other day, that I offend you at any time with anything I tried to do with those people. That's the highest praise. I know I can teach. I could teach when I was 21. I didn't know anything about the golf swing. I could get people to hit the ball better. But at this point in time, if I'm going to go around going sunny and sunny and sunny, if the scientist watched me teach, you go, eh, I, don't, you know, I might, you know, that's fine. I'll, you're, you're cool. So, so anyway, pull back, run up, and jump. So two things survived the pre-science era uh, observational. One, you already heard today, the Sergio Garcia is putting the hula hoop in the ground and pulling the hula hoop out of the ground. The second one is the pullback, run up, and jump. So the pullback, run up, and jump is the movement of the left shoulder in the swing. Can I borrow you? Nice looking, long hitting, well dressed young man. Swinging this way. Okay. So now we've got different angles. I'll try to move y'all. We'll start you know, with the camera and then we'll. Okay. So go ahead. Now you can do this yourself in any line drawing program or Photoshop or whatever. Maybe you can draw a picture. Get them at a dress, draw an orange size circle around the shoulder socket. Okay, so I'm gonna point this to the middle of that, like the point in the middle of that orange, like the, the little, right. right? Now, make your back. Whoa, no. <laughs> right, so the movement of his left shoulder down and back, right, because you know there's gonna be some left side bend, it's gonna go down and back. His not so much down, that's great. I like that for the driver, especially a long hitter. So that's the pullback. Okay. What's the pullback? White Stones didn't jump over his bar from here. He went over here. He pulled back a certain amount. Okay. Into the top and hold it. You can make a bigger back out of the way. All right. Oh, I screwed up. Go back to the dressing, sorry. I've never done this like this before. It's pretty cool. Like I'm on this side. Okay. So here's the original one. Do the pullback. Okay. Now come down and I'll tell you when to stop. So like this. So you don't do it. I'll bet you $500 you can do that. Okay. Do it again. <laughs> five, five hundred. I got it in my wallet. I'll bet that right now. Okay. Because you wouldn't hit it past me. Okay. So when he comes down, when his left shoulder, I'll do it this way. When his left shoulder gets back to the line the center line of that left shoulder, it'll be one orange at least underneath where it was. So you, you do this to me. You point that thing at my left shoulder. I'll show you some balls. <laughs> <laughs> so point it right in the middle of my left shoulder, but not too close. So pull back. I'm doing a driver swing. Run up. See, when it got back to that line, it's under it. And then it'll go right around, it'll go right around, it'll go forward and around and come up the other side, jump. I call it the pullback, right stones, thank you. The pullback, run up and jump. So that's the travel of the left shoulder pullback. Now I'm doing the run up, and now I'm doing the jump. And when I first saw it, I went, that can't be right. How could the Library of Congress full of golf books not know that when really dynamic swingers of the club, and the three people I have in the presentation, Bobby Clamp at 1982, Ben Hogan, I think it's Shell's Wonderful World of Golf, but he was still pretty dynamic, and Sadlowski before he started taking golf lessons. Yeah. So all three of those people, when their left shoulder gets back to the center line of that shoulder socket on the downswing, well below where it was. And then it goes a little forward of it, comes back, and winds up high on the other side. So that's just another way to look at this movement that ground reaction force is helping you. They got two players that when their left shoulder gets back to that, that vertical line, it's right back where it was at address. They tend to be medium length hitters, so to speak. And Hogan, me and Ben Doyle. Oh, Ben. Okay, so, so. 
ground reaction fluid spectra stuff has changed me this way as a teacher. I used to sort of favor with most people a little bit more what the 3D people call right side bend at the top, a little more look of right lean at the top. But if you start looking at those vectors, you're going, wait a minute, if you go right foot right here, you're not going to, you're going to look a whole lot more like Kyle Montgomery than you're going to look like Curtis Strange. And it should be noted, we got a guy here that I met at lunch that worked for Ballard, that not with Ballard teaches. Ballard does not, he's been misrepresented as he taught this. Ballard, like pretty steep shoulders, he taught this. So what Curtis was, was doing, they were always kind of fighting back and forth. Sutton was a little bit closer, I think, to the Ballard's model.